All right, let's get started. So, uh, so my name is Jonathan, and I'm going to be talking to you about FreeRTOS on Zen. So let's see, does this work? Yes, all right. So the, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some background and motivation for why I did this work and where the project stands today. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about how we approached it and some challenges we faced along the way, and then tell you about some highlights of the project, and then leave you with a, some sort of ideas for what I think would make this kind of work easier for the next folks that are going to attempt it. So I'll start by kind of apologizing. If this taps into your dystopian nightmares about, about the future, then, then I apologize. But, but this is a quadcopter drone made by Parrot called the AR drone. And this thing is about, uh, it's about that, that, that big, and you can fly it around with your tablet or your cell phone. And you can uh, buy it on Amazon, and it's got a couple of digital cameras on it. It's got one on top and one on the front. And um, inside this craft, there are two computer systems. There's a, a Linux based, an ARM based computer system that's running embedded Linux. And embedded Linux is going to be running anything from the, the video camera software to flight planning and the wireless hotspot. On board this craft is a wireless hotspot that the user is actually connecting to when they're flying the craft. And connected to the ARM based computer, there's a FreeRTOS system that's running on microcontrollers. And FreeRTOS, is, in this case, is responsible for running the autopilot of the craft. And um, what that's going to be doing is it's going to be taking sensor measurements about 1,000 times a second and take, using those sensor measurements of, say, wind speed or velocity or altitude to make subtle adjustments in the motor speeds of the craft to keep it on a stable flight path. And when the user is navigating the craft, user input will go, say, from the cell phone on the ground over the wireless network through the Linux system and through the flight planning software in Linux. And then commands and changes will be passed to the autopilot to, to change the, the path of the craft. And our, our goal in working with systems like this at Galwa is to do hardware consolidation. So instead of running uh, an ARM-based computer with Linux and, and next to that microcontrollers with FreeRTOS, what we want to do is run them both in Zen domains so that we can um, open up lots of interesting runtime uh, flexibility and, and cool uh, technology options with those. Um, security being one of those if you, if you were at Adam's talk. And so there are some benefits to this, and, and certainly the hardware design is simpler because we don't need the microcontrollers anymore, and there's no serial interface connecting them to Linux. But we also have what's called lower swap, or space, weight, and power. The hardware design of the system takes up less room, it weighs less, and it uses less uh, power. But I think the most interesting thing that we get out of this is runtime flexibility, because you might imagine that if you've got your Linux domain and the next to that your autopilot, you could spin up a backup autopilot in case the primary crashes. You could also imagine doing things like uh, updating the autopilot software while the craft is in the air by spinning up the new version in a, in a secondary domain and then switching to it when it's ready. So there's a lot of cool things you can do. And then, if, if, again, if you were at the Unicronals talk, you, there's all other ideas here about doing things like monitoring the signals that are being sent to the autopilot and checking, is it being sent off uh, its original mission path or something? So we can do detection and, and prevent those signals from being delivered. So, so doing this kind of thing gives us lots of software control over what we can do with the autopilot. Now, we're doing this work in connection with a related project at Galois called Smack and Pilot. And the goal of Smack and Pilot is to allow engineers to write high assurance autopilot software. So what they do is they write autopilot software in a high level implementation language, like Haskell or some other unikernel implementation language. And then they, from that, we use the tools to generate a C implementation that runs on FreeRTOS. So they don't have to write the C by hand anymore. And we can eliminate entire classes of bugs by allowing engineers to do this. And if you want to learn more, you can, learn, you can go to smackandpilot.org. And I'll give another link to that at the end of the talk. Um, so what we wanted to be able to do is to take these generated autopilots that are higher assurance and run them on Zen next to our Linux-based system on crafts like the, the Parrot drone. So now I'll tell you a bit about where the project stands today. So what we have right now is FreeRTOS 7.6.0 running on Zen 4.4. We developed this on an Arndale board, and we did this in the, the earlier part of this year. And um, one of the things that we're really a big fan of is open source. So we're, right now we're in the process of getting this work released as open source. So you can expect this, that to show up on our GitHub page in the, the next few weeks. And along the way, uh, we also needed a C library for OS development, as one often does. And so we decided to take the C library as part of the HAL VM and split that up as a separate package. And that's also now available on our GitHub page. So what's remaining is that we still need to, to more deeply understand how to get really true real-time guarantees out of the guests on Zen. And certainly one of the things we can do is use the airing scheduler that was mentioned earlier. Um, and then there are all these new exciting features coming out in 4.5 4 about uh, the new real-time scheduling capabilities. So we'll, we want to be investigating those. 
The second thing we want to do is test this with the latest Zen, because we did this earlier this year, and then we put the project down and moved on and had other things to do. So we want to pick it back up and keep it going on the, on the latest Zen and make sure there haven't been any regressions. And the last thing is that, again, because we care about open source, we're also interested in exploring whether we can get this adopted by some community, maybe the Free Artos community or the Zen community, um, but we'd like it to live on. So now uh, I'll tell you a little bit how, about how we, we kind of approach the process of doing this work. So we split the process of porting uh, Free RTOS to Zen into two phases. And the first phase was to just take the Free RTOS core, which is pretty tiny, and getting it running on a generic ARM environment. And it, it, during this phase, we deliberately ignored pervert features of Zen. So we weren't really thinking of this as a, as a well-behaved Zen guest. We were just trying to use Zen as an ARM development platform. And the only thing we needed to do this was the, the console I.O. hypercall. And what the, that sort of took the place of what you would get from a serial console on, an, on actual ARM hardware. Yeah. So the free RTOS code base is, uh, it includes ports for dozens of architectures. And there's a, most of them are microcontrollers, but there actually was an A9 port, and I used that as sort of inspiration for the work that I did, and, and, and Minios, which I'll get to next. So yeah. So it did, it did run on ARM already. However, the, the catch is that it was for a different tool chain. It was for the Renesis tool chain, which isn't what we wanted to use, so we had to basically gut it all out and, and re-implement it. So, so again, the take-home point for phase one is just start with the core, uh, the core code base and getting it, getting it running on an ARM. That was the, the, the primary objective. And we, we only needed one thing from Zen to do that. The second phase of development was to take that ARM kernel that we had developed and then start instrumenting it with all of the things we needed to run it to get it to run as a well-behaved Zen guest. And so w the idea here was, well, we thought, Jonathan's new to implementing ARM guests on Zen, so what's the, what's the minimal canonical example of, of code that we could use to learn how to do this? And it seemed like Minios was a good choice, and fortunately there was, a, there was already a Minios uh, ARM port that was emerging online. So we took that and we learned how to use the hypercalls from that, and then we borrowed Zen bus, event channels, current tables, and the, the console from that. We also had to uh, implement support for the GIC, so that we also found a GIC implementation in that emerging port. So phase one was get it running on ARM. Phase two was now really get it running on Zen. And once we had all these features, then we could certainly start talking to other domains and doing really interesting stuff. So no project is without some roadblocks, and I want to call out a couple. And the first one is that new guests reveal virtualization gaps. And this is not a bad thing, um, but in particular, uh, I think uh, uh, Julian, or no, Stefano mentioned this, that the, that the 4.5 is going to be releasing support for more features of the GIC. And that's because we ran into this on FreeRTOS, and FreeRTOS wants to use a couple of ARM interrupt controller features that uh, when we, tr we started to try to use these, we got really strange hypervisor behavior. So thanks to Stefano's efforts and Ian Campbell and, and Julian Grawl, now we have support for those features, and we can uh, virtualize more of the ARM hardware feature set. And so I think the moral of the story here is certainly that having more diversity of guests running on Zen means that Zen gets better as a result. So it was a challenge initially, but, uh, but now we've moved on. So the second thing that I ran into uh, is this, and that it's that, again, as a newcomer to doing this kind of work, I found that I didn't really know where to look to know that I knew everything. And I found there's a couple of particular headers I needed to read to learn how to use the hypercalls and the, the ABI requirements and so on. And that as a, sort of a, as a backstop for learning how to write ARM guests, I could look at the Linux source uh, to see how Linux was doing it. Although I have to add that in the case of Linux, because it's so much more obfuscated and, and convoluted, because it's, it supports more architectures and it has a lot more going on in it, um, as a newcomer I found that Linux is, it works, you can get inspiration from it, but it's hard to know that you, you have confidence that you, you understand why it's doing it the way that it is. So I think the, the moral of the story with this one is, um, it would be, I think it would help newcomers to consolidate the documentation for this process. Uh, much like Julian's talk, he gave a, a good summary of here are all the things you're going to need to worry about. And I think if we pull all those together in one document, then that'll help newcomers. So, uh, so this, this isn't going to come as a surprise to anybody, but um, I don't know of any enterprise deployments of Minios, so I'm not surprised that it's not that well tested. But I do think that it's worth uh, thinking really hard about how we can do this, especially in, in the face of the new testing infrastructure, because I think that you know, new unit kernel implementers are going to come to Minios as, you know, again, what's the minimal canonical example I can use to learn? And even what, you know, where can I borrow some code from? And if the Minios code is buggy or misleading, then we're going to borrow those bugs, and we're going to just keep proliferating those code bases. So I think it's, it's worth it. And in this case, we did actually find some, some pretty bad synchronization bugs in the Zenbus implementation in Minios that we had to fix. So, 
And then this was uh, this is a bit more anecdotal, but uh, we actually ran into a security vulnerability by accident because it turns out that there was a there was a problem where if you crafted a kernel binary in just such a way with your Z image header um, m sort of malformed, you could crash Excel and get it a seg fault when you try to create a domain. And we we initially borrowed Z image header generation code from Minios, and it worked for a while. And then we got it wrong, and then it started seg faulting Excel. And when I reported this bug, it turns out it was actually a security vulnerability that had not even yet been disclosed, and we had to keep a little quiet about it until that came out. So now I'll tell you about some, some nice things about the project. So the first one is this. We sort of alluded to this earlier. Um, but Xenon ARM is actually a good development platform. And I think it's really worth thinking about it this way, because if you've ever done any ARM hardware development, you know that Getting to know each and every ARM board is a chore. It's each and every one is a little different, and you have to understand the bootloader and the flashing process and the, the console and everything. And so if you can use Zen to do your development of, of like sort of like the early stage bare metal code that you have to write in your, in your kernel, then you have a much shorter development cycle. You can have a lot more inspection capabilities. You don't need to worry about JTAG and that kind of thing. Um, and we actually found this to be enormously useful. So we actually did a lot of our early development. That phase one that I talked about was all on Zen. And I would, I would totally want to start there in the future for doing bare metal development and then move it onto the board once I started to have, have to deal with real hardware. And again, I also want to call out, uh, say thanks to Kareem for writing the early Minios ARM port. Because if we hadn't had this, we would have had to slog through the Linux source to learn how to do this. And so having that minimal example was really the key to getting us going quickly on this project. So. Thanks to him. And I also want to call out three folks in particular. I want to say thanks to Ian, Julian, and Stefano for doing so much, at least it seemed to me. Uh, via email, I would report bugs after trying for a week to figure out whether it was my fault. And they would either say, yes, it is your fault, or they'd say, here, 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 here are some patches to the hypervisor. Now we, we, now we support more features. So I, I really appreciate all your help. And so now I want to just leave you with some ideas for, uh, again, how I think this uh, this process could go a little bit more easily for, for people to do it in the future. And the first one is what I'm going to call paravert driver bug fix negotiation. And now this was not really having to do with FreeRTOS, but we, we are running multiple Linux domains on our project, so this did come up. So the idea is right now we have these paravert drivers that do a little bit of feature negotiation through ZenStore. They communicate key value pairs about features they intend to negotiate on. And I want to pro propose a slight extension to that, which is that these drivers at probe time ought to also negotiate on the parity of, of bug fixes in, in, in both ends and refuse to operate together if only one end has a particular bug fix. And this came up concretely for us because we have uh, two Linux domains. We have a, a DOM0 and a DOMU. And the DOM0 kernel is much older because on ARM boards that tends to be the case. And the DOMU is much newer. And the DOMU block driver actually had a bug fix in it that was missing from DOM0. And when these, when these drivers actually went to work together, we had kernel seg faults as a result, kernel crashes. So, I think that the key point here is that in the ARM space in particular, every time a new board comes out, there's a new vendor patch Linux source tree sitting in a corner somewhere. And it usually lags behind by some amount of, of time. And the DOM user are potentially going to get, uh, kind of continue to make progress. The DOM zero kernels are going to be older, a little bit more stale. And so there's, the, uh, there's just, just a higher chance that there's going to be a bug fix in some paravert driver on one end and not the other. So if we can, if we can at least tell the user um, we're going to refuse to work together, then the user knows that either one of the kernels has to be patched or one of the kernels has to be downgraded. So the second thing that I want to propose is this idea called, that I'm just going to call libzen guest. And the idea is that if you think to that, back to that phase two of develop, development that I described where we took our, our basic ARM kernel and we equipped it with all these Zen features, that could have been replaced by link against this library and implement a couple of, of relevant interfaces. And I think certainly one of the things that would have, made it easy, it would have made it easier for us to have some confidence that we were doing it right, because we were having to otherwise sort of cobble together pieces of code from Minios, understanding it as we go and fixing bugs as we go. And one of the things that would also get us as a community is have a, a, a single or at least a smaller number of better tested implementations that were shared by, let's say, the Unikernel community, as well as anyone who wanted to play with Minios or anyone who wanted to, to port, let's say, you know, there's a, a gentleman here who wants to port OS 9. He could, we could certainly hand him this library and say, yeah, all you have to do is read this document, link against this library, and, and then here's a couple of interfaces you have to implement so that, that this library can get, in, get its fingers into your operating systems, interrupt controller, uh, and you know, scheduling and that, that sort of thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we won't call it that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I guess in, in my experience, what I found is that in Minios, um, 
all of these things are, are a little bit more intertwined with the rest of Minios than I would like if I were <laughs> supposed to be. Okay, yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so yeah, so, so I think morally then, then we're on the same page. And then the last thing is this. And so I think that the, the idea here was it, this would be a companion uh, document that goes with that library, which is essentially targeted at newcomers that says, oh, you have an operating system. You understand that operating system really well. Okay, well, you want to integrate it with Zen. Here's what you have to do. Here are the relevant hypercalls for your architecture. Here are the ABI requirements. Um, and, and then you, we could either put, put in references to docs on Zen store and event channels and so on, or we could have that material in there as well. But the idea would be that you could read that document and maybe, maybe even link against that other library, and then you'd have really high confidence that you were done, that you, knew, that you got it right and that you used a community-tested code base, um, and that all the documentation that you needed was in one spot and you didn't have to go hunting for it somewhere else. And, and actually, I'm more than happy to start working on a first draft of this if anybody finds that idea appealing. So let me know. All right. I'm going to go down this rabbit hole sometime in the next month or so. Okay, good to know. So in summary, we've got FreeRTOS 7.6.0 running on Zen 4.4. Uh, we are anticipating an open source release of the FreeRTOS code base very soon. So keep an eye on our GitHub page, which is linked right there. You can also get the C library that we forked from HalVM on that page as well. And if you're interested in learning more about our autopilot project, you can do that at smackandpilot.org. Anybody have any questions? So that is yeah, that's yeah. So I think that that does go back to one of the sort of to the to do the to do list items that we had, which is um, see how much we can get out of either the new scheduling capabilities in Zen or CPU pinning, for example. We actually did find that even just doing CPU pinning, we're able to get uh, acceptable interrupt latencies for the most part. So it's it's kind of a, I think for me it's a question of you know just getting it under a certain bound that we can predict, and it doesn't necessarily have to be as low as it might be on real hardware. Um, for example, the crafts that we're looking at, these things run at 1,000 hertz. They process interrupts from sensors at that rate. And just to, from doing CPU pinning, we're able to get awfully close to the, doing that with, uh, with pretty good regularity. Yeah, the problem is the, the failure Yeah, it's true. Yeah, the craft will come out of the air or it will do erratic things. Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely a road ahead there. Anybody else? Uh, well, I can't say anything specific about it because I don't remember. Like, I don't know actually what the bug fix was that so was missing. This I think was Ian. Pre the ARM ABI being declared stable, uh, and it turned out that 3264 bit ARM was differing in their layout, like the 86 does. So we took the opportunity to fix that. We obviously then guessed before and after that what the shape But yeah, now that we've declared the ABI stable, we can look at that. Yeah, and I don't really know how realistic it is to think that that we could emerge with these, these sort of parity problems, but yeah, but it does it does. Case you had, I think we wouldn't have done because we had explicitly not declared the ABI stable. But oh. certainly for bugs going forward, it's something to bear in mind. Cool. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>